Hispanic point. I always hit them. <laughs> and I wanted to say boom. Okay, ready? Recorder's on? Okay, let's call to order the meeting of the March 3rd, 2022 Historic Preservation Board. And if you could call the roll, please. Jason Finn? Here. Robert Ostinoff? Here. Lise Lindstrom? Here. Rhonda Saxon? Here. Jim Chard? Here. Claudia Willis? Absent. Benjamin Baffer? Here. Is Claudia calling in? Does anybody know? She's not. She's, She's not, okay. Are there any changes to the agenda? No. No changes to the agenda. Do we have minutes to review? No. You know, minutes, let's uh, swear in the public. Should I move that we Mr. approve the agenda? Yes, please. I so move. Second. I'll second. Ms. Finn? Approving yes. the agenda. Yes. Robert Ostinov? Yes. Lise Lindstrom? Yes. Anna Saxon? Yes. In charge? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. So now we'll swear in the public. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks. If, if anybody from the public plans to speak, if you guys could stand up so that you can be sworn in by Madam Clerk. Please raise your right hand by the authority best to me, the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? <laughs> Are there any comments from the public that are not related to the quasi-judicial items on the agenda? Seeing none, do we have any presentations? No. Okay, so we'll move right into our quasi-judicial hearing items. I will read the rules. Quasi-judicial hearing items this hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission or board or members of staff of the, or the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. Decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, or may a decision be made on the numbers of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. And we are limiting application, or presentations to 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, for the record, I'm Katharina Pelavoda, um, Historic Preservation Planner. Um, I would like to enter COA 2022-098 into the record. It's for Atlantic Grove Townhomes. It's a certificate of appropriateness. And the applicant, Chris Calderback, is here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Calderbank. I am uh, from the Atlantic Grove Townhome Community. I live at 38 Northwest Third Avenue, and I am on the board of the HOA, along with um, Eric Mintz, who's the president, and Dominic D'Archangelo, who's our treasurer. So thank you for hearing us today. Um, we are, uh, as the slide says, looking for a approval to change the roofing over our front doors to metal from the current asphalt shingles. Um, and I'll take you just through a couple things, a little bit about what's going on in the community now. 
why we're making this change and others we're proposing uh, in the future and some we've already done and just some examples that I think are in line with what we're uh, trying to achieve. This is the area we're speaking of. Um, inside the red, those are the eight existing buildings uh, with 55 individual units and individual entranceway doors with the roofs above them that we're looking to change. Uh, the two buildings that are not inside the red are those that have already been approved and are about to uh, be built by new urban communities. So when those come in, those will be 14 new units, will be 69 units in all. Um, this is kind of what's going on uh, right now in our community that we've undertaken. Um, myself and my two fellow board members, there's 55 units, as I mentioned, we're non-contributing, and I already mentioned there's 14 new units or two buildings coming. Um, in light of the fact that the new buildings are coming, we've gone through, I guess what I would call a refresh of the community. The community was not in bad shape in any way, but we felt there's some things that we could do to keep ourselves looking, um, you know, move the uh, kind of the level of the community up. I don't know if you've driven past there, but you'll already notice if you have that the building in the back, uh, all of them have already been painted. That is the new color scheme. That is the color scheme that was approved um, by this board um, for the new buildings that are coming and we've adopted it. So the buildings are been, have just been painted. We just completed that in December. So that's a brand new fresh look for us. We're here seeking approval for the metal roofing today which would be over the front doors. You can see one of them just to the left side of that building. Each unit has one, then one to the right's blocked by trees. Um, we also have a pool area expansion coming that's all, already been approved. Current cabana is being torn down, new cabana being built, the pool area is being enlarged. Um, that's part of what New Urban is doing. So you can kind of get a feel for what we're trying to accomplish there. The real objective here and why we're going through all this change, because we could easily just put asphalt shingles on top of that roof for um, less than half the cost that, that uh, apparently, is that we're really trying to match what's coming. That is the buildings, the buildings on the right that have been approved. The, I was here last night, the final plat was just approved. Um, and we're trying to look like one community, not two separate communities or two separate sections. So you can see the building on the left is prior to painting. And this is what we look like now. So we're prepared for the new buildings to come in. Um, and we think it'll look very nice once everything is kind of cohesive. So that's what we're seeking to do. Specifically, um, those roofs over the front doors are in, in you know, poor condition. They're not end of life. They're not uh, needing to be replaced other than visually. They've still got five or six years left, um, but we think it's time to do it. The roofs down below don't look good. There's a lot, you know, there's drip paint, there's caulking, there's, and you can see them when you walk by, unlike the roof on top of the third floor, which is not visible unless you cross the street. So we're looking to specifically do black metal roofing. We think it would go well. As you can see, we have a black fence around the community. We have black railings on the second floor, kind of hidden by the tree. Um, we have black front doors, black garage doors, black lights as you go. So we're looking to do black metal roofing. We think it would be a nice complement to the entranceway. Um, and we do have a commitment um, for Tim Hernandez, the principal at New Urban Community, that if you do approve this, he will also adopt the same material for their roofing. Because again, that is really our objective when we set out, is to look like a single cohesive community rather than the new section and the old section or anything like that. I did take a little time to go through um, some of the historic districts and take a few pictures. Um, there's obviously metal roofing that's throughout the historic districts, various colors, greens, sil um, silvers. You can also see in the, the picture in the center bottom that's actually Cannery Row, but there's metal roofing above a front door. It's just like what we want to do. Are there any questions for me? That is my last slide. It was brief. Hope you appreciate that. <laughs> any questions? I think we'll take staff's presentation and then sure. we'll call you up we'll with any questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, 
Once again, this is COA 2022-097, sorry, 098, um, Certificate of Appropriateness um, for Atlantic Group Townhomes. So um, the property is located within a development known as um, Atlantic Grove, which is a mixed-use development. The site's located within the West Atlantic Avenue redevelopment area of the Central Business District. Um, this portion of the property is also located in the West Settlers Historic District. So here is the entire property for the um, Atlantic, Grove town, Atlantic Grove townhomes. Um, the site currently contains eight three-story buildings. There are eight buildings containing 55 townhomes with two-car garages, a cabana building, uh, two mi and two mixed-use buildings that contain um, 47,856 square feet um, of retail office and restaurant space and 20 residential um, condominium units which front the Atlantic Avenue area. So that specific area is discussed here with the condos, but it's not a part of this um, request tonight. Um, let's see. Um, in April 6th, um, 2012, there was a class five um, site plan modification and certificate of appropriateness request that was approved. And that included the construction of 14 new three-story townhomes within two buildings along Northwest 4th Avenue and the interior site. So that would be this um, vacant land right here. Um, the utilization of the residential incentive program also allowed to increase the density. Um, let's see, workhouse, um, work housing units were also included. Demolition of the existing cabana and bathroom areas and the reconstruction of them in another area were also part of the, um, the previous request. So this subject request includes the material change from asphalt shingle on the front porch brows to be replaced with black metal standing seam. So here is another um, image site plan of the proposal. So this shows all of the different um, townhome areas to which the um, request includes. Here you see this is the infill that was previously approved back in April. Okay, this is building one south, so um, the circled areas here, you can see all of the, um, the front porch brows that are requested to have the material change. Here we have building two on the east. You can see those um, those brows here. Building three, building four, building five, building six, seven, eight, and that's it. So here we can see this was. Um, a 3D streetscape that was part of the um, the previously approved uh, COA for the infill. So here you can see the existing um, townhomes. You can see the elevations for that to which the um, the brows are being requested to change to the metal um, from the asphalt shingle. As Mr. Um, Calderbank mentioned, um, the new infill um, was discussed with new urban communities and um, what, what's approved for this request tonight, um, they will, they'll match for visual compatibility with the, with the site. This is the requested color. It's, um, it's black in the um, standing seam metal roof material. So as mentioned in our staff report, um, you know, this, this property was constructed in 2003. So as it has not reached its 50 year compatibility or eligibility, it's considered a non-contributing structure. The entire property is non-contributing because um, of the new construction. Um, for this specific type of um, architectural style, let me specifically see. Uh, it's masonry vernacular with um, 
an Anglo-Caribbean influence, the type of roof would be appropriate um, as a change to the specific style. However, we did see a slight concern regarding the black finish, mostly because within a historic district, mill finish is usually used, so we consider that more an appropriate color. Um, but if the board wishes to discuss, um, that was a recommended um, color for um, this request, but the board can discuss whether um, to change it or not. Okay, these are the findings. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. Hey, um, before we move into public comments, do we have an ex parte communication on this item? Robert? Any ex parte communication? No. 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 I was at the city commission on a meeting last night where uh, they approved the final plan. That's for the new, for the new. That's for the new. So it's, it's basically no. No. OK. Public comments. Have the address on here. Would you mind, Alice, would you mind coming up to the podium if you're going to make a public comment? <laughs> Sorry. Alice Spence, 707 Place Tavant, Delray Beach. Um, I'm looking for an address, so if I went down Atlantic Avenue, I would like to be able to know exactly where this is. Okay, um, I don't have the address on our agenda. Uh, Katarina, would you, would you happen to have the address? You can enter into the record. <laughs> A phantom building going up with no address. <laughs> So um, this particular property, because there's so many different townhomes and residences, um, the, the PCN numbers, when you look up different addresses, it spans the, like, in the entire block of it. So when the application came in, there wasn't a specific address. Um, so it's referred to as the Atlantic Grove townhomes. Um, I don't know if Chris has any further. Yeah, we, we struggled with that on the... <laughs> Right, that's right. There was no single address. We don't have um, an office or a clubhouse that has an address. We have our individual units, you know, condos. but, mm -hmm. pardon? Condos. Townhomes, yeah, yeah. So there's no specific address we use when we get mail, we send it to our management company, which okay. is not in Delray Beach. Thank you. Is there, are there any further public comments from Could, I think you can Google Atlantic Grove townhomes. It's that whole area. If you want, I can show you on the map. If that's helpful. I, I think during this point in public comment, you might be able to talk to somebody on the side of this, but I, I think as far as public comment <laughs> is going, it's... Northwest 3rd Avenue, then. Yes. Yeah. Time for... Thank you. Is there any rebuttal or cross-examination? from staff or the applicant. Do you have any comment or rebuttal? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'd call it rebuttal, but um, you know, I, I think we're in agreement, hopefully, that the metal roofing is appropriate. We've obviously asked for black. There's been a recommendation that there might be a better choice. Obviously, we'll abide by what you decide. We think, though, for the reasons already stated, the metal fronts, the you know, it's it's pretty appealing to keep the fronts the same color, with the uh, the railings and the fencing and the lighting and et cetera. So, that's all I would add to what's been said so far. Okay. Thank you. Staff has a rebuttal. 
No more rebuttal or cross-examination. We can go right into board discussion. I have a question. Um, what are the what is the roof material both for the new development, the two new buildings, and the existing buildings that have these porches? What, what's the overall roof made of? Irene, do you know what was approved on the new? For the new projects? So the, the new townhomes that are for the infill, they do have the asphalt shingle roof to match the original, um, what's existing on all of the townhomes right now. Um, however, I do believe, I guess in, a in phases, eventually they will eventually ask for a metal roof for the entire property. But for now, I guess they're sticking with the asphalt shingle and then just the, the accents on the metal brow. So for visual compatibility pur purposes, um, when the new townhomes get built, they don't actually have the same door brow as what's existing. They have them over the balconies. So they'll be matching what's approved from this COA on the balconies. So the tiny accent um, roofs will, will match what's existing on the property. The main roofs are? They're asphalt shingle. Asphalt shingle roofs mm -hmm. on both. Yep, correct. And black they're I think they're brown right now the the roofs are brown brown asphalt shingle Sir, sorry you gotta come up to this mic please there you go okay they're mostly I think they're just asking about the existing yeah color. yeah uh, the current um, asphalt shingles on our our existing eight buildings are a, a brown color um, because the buildings were in that color palette. Um, and we didn't choose to leave that color behind, but what was approved for the new units was not brown. The buildings are, as you saw, the color palette. It's light gray with blue, um, and that way the darker color goes better. On the new buildings, what will be the shingle color? I don't want to speak for new urban communities, but from the renderings I've seen, they look uh, grayish. Dark color. They look dark in color, if we want to go back to my presentation, but because the one picture in there is actually new urban's mock up. And at this time, you're not looking to change the main buildings only? No, we're not looking to do that. And they're not even visible hardly from the street anyway. Um, if you go back to slide five, right there, and yeah, the one on the right, it's kind of hard to tell here, but that's new, uh, just build it out here. There we go. That's New Urban's mock-up on the right. That's not an actual built building. It looks dark slate, maybe, I don't know. The, the color of paint on our building, though, is identical to theirs. We took the actual Sherwin-William colors and matched. And we did get a certificate of appropriateness on that. It's administratively approved. That's administrative. Yes. I'm learning. <laughs> okay. May I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I? I've got about three questions. Um, mm -hmm. One is to staff, and it's sort of the opposite of what I'm going to ask the gentleman. Why not black? What? Well, historically, when um, houses were constructed with metal roofs, um, in, our, in the time frame that we look at historic districts, usually from um, 19, I think, late 1960s, 1970s, and you know earlier, um, the roofs were mill finish. So if we're looking historically at colors, um, we didn't really see black. So going with visual, visual compatibility um, with the district, that's why um, the mill finish is usually recommended. But this oh, is a, this. I will say this is a new constructed, um, a newer constructed building um, since it was built in two thousand three. So it's it's not eligible for any type of historic, you know, designation or you know, far in the future probably, but not currently at this point. Uh, I did notice, however, that in the examples that were given, particularly at the tennis center, it, it did have metal seam roof, and that one was green. Uh, that's 
in the neighborhood, why would staff, I'm sure there's a good reason why staff wouldn't do that. Well, I know in the past our guidelines weren't as strong as they are now. Um, so last slide. The last slide, thank you. So um, I don't know if you recall, maybe a year or so ago, they also redid the marina and they had little pavilions that also matched that green color. But when it went to the board, they were going to stick with the green color, but our recommend recommendation was mill finish to match the district. Yeah. So um, any structures that would come in in the future, that would more than likely be our recommendation. But if you notice here, majority of the structures do still have that mill finish um, roof color. And uh, it's Mr. Calderac, am I saying that right? Uh, why, uh, why not another color than black? Uh, you've mentioned the new palette that, you've, mm -hmm. that you're using, gray and blue, I think. Uh, yeah. why, why not that? We felt that it was the, the best match. Um, in a complementary way, aesthetically. Um, what staff's re recommending isn't terrible. You know, it's not, it's not like it's pink, um, and it would clash completely. Um, but we felt, again, if you, you know, if we look at our community, there's so many uh, items on there that are black. You can see right there the front door, the fence around the community, the railing on the second floor, and if you could see through trees, you'd see a black light mounted to the front of the house, right? And the black the garage doors around back. So that's it was. We felt it was complimentary. And I will say that um, I look out the window and I see the tennis center in my front yard. It's green. <laughs> so <laughs> literally, I look right at it. So. And my my last question is. Uh, has this been discussed in the community and this is the consensus that has emerged? We've discussed this on multiple board meetings uh, with the community. We've discussed it in writing. Um, we send out community updates every 45 days or so uh, and have discussed it. Uh, and we've recently uh, done a small one-time assessment for things like the painting and the black metal roofs. We specifically call it black metal roofing. Not that that's a drop dead thing but we do call it that so yes we communicate it pretty extensively we're only 55 units so mm -hmm. you could walk around the block and meet half the people yeah. I'm good all right so um, just my, my thoughts are I, I think the standing steam metal roof is the absolute right solution uh, for these for these little doors um, I just, I, I too question the black, and because I'm sitting here thinking of where have I ever seen a black standing seam roof, and I can't, I, I've seen green, I've seen a lot of silver, gray, even a dark bronze color, but I don't know that I've ever seen a black standing seam roof, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, but, you know, this, my, my thoughts would be a, a mill finish would, would it just as nicely into the, into the new color palette with the, the gray and the blue. I would agree, and I'm hesitant about the fact that the actual roofs are still going to be brown for who knows how long, and you've got brown and black versus a brown and a mill finish that might be at least a little bit more cohesive. Can I, can I, make I know that there, <laughs> unless unless the board specifically addressing with a question. Um, I know that the uh, the comment was that you can't see it until you're stepped further back from the structure which is you know something to consider but um just, my opinion Kristen it's hard to kind of see from the pictures a little bit but can you hold up that example that you brought in a sample can we see that again So I think uh, a thought that the least just put in my head was at some point they're going to replace the main roof. So then the question is, what do they, you know, 
and, and I'm sure nobody has the answer to that now, but at some point they'll, they'll want to replace the main roof and it will probably want to match whatever the roofing is on these, these por porches. Asphalt. It was a lot higher. Yeah. These are small, you know, kind of quick fix items. I that's gonna be a much larger footprint. That's just not gonna be necessary. I might like to add I'm that um, I'm not even sure that I like the mixture of the asphalt shingle with the standing seam on the same building. Uh, but like you're mentioning, at some point the roofs will have to be changed, so I would be more inclined to go with the mill finish versus the black, even for the, um, the project that they're doing currently. Any more discussion? Ready to move on? At least. I see that look. All right. <laughs> approve certificate. Of, oh, sorry. I move to approve certificate of appropriateness 2022-098 request associated with the replacement of asphalt sing shingle to metal roofing on the front porch brow of the non-contributing property for the property located at Atlantic Grove, located within the West Settlers Historic District, by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Subject to the following conditions, the proposed roof color should be a mill finish. Second. Kristen Finn? No. Robert Ostinoff? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Linda Saxton? Yes. Jim Chard? No. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. A tie. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Michelle Hoyland, Principal Planner, Development Services Department. I'd like to enter file number 2020-080 into the record for the project known as Sunday Village. This is a class three site plan, certificate of appropriateness, landscape plan, architectural elevations, variances and relocations. The applicant is here and will present to the board. Good evening, Mike Cavelli, uh, 1209 South Swinton Avenue, uh, representing PEP Capital. The owners are here tonight with members of the design team as well. Um, this is a massive set of plants that I know is really very hard to comprehend in terms of, of what you have. And so we're, we're going to try to uh, interpret those plans and turn them into images so that we can show you um, how those plans look, you know, in, in a more comprehensive way. Um, so um, as we go through this, we'll show you architecture, we'll show you landscaping, um, and we'll show you the site plan changes, so in, in, in various items that we're dealing with. So the property is located south of Atlantic Avenue. Um, North, Swinton Avenue is north and south through the middle of the project and First Street is, is east and west through four blocks. Um, there is a certified site plan for all four blocks. Tonight we're going to talk about block 61. 
Um, and this is a copy of the certified plan. As you know, there is a proposal to modify the site plan and uh, in before you. Here's a comparison of the plan side by side. The, the top plan is a certified plan, and if you notice, the, the mass of the plans are very similar with the exception of the historical homes in the upper right-hand corner uh, have been shifted around a little uh, on the proposed modification. Um, you also have a variance request in front of you for these two, two buildings to be moved five feet beyond the uh, setback line, um, and I'll show you why in, in, in a minute. Um, on the certified plan, there is an underground parking garage and a drainage vault, and the blue squares represent the ultimate location of where those, those houses were going to go. As you can see, you can't put those houses in that location until the, the underground structures were built. So as a result, those structures are going to be put up on girders and stored in, in the side of the property while all of this construction took place uh, in, for the underground vault and, and the parking garage. When the vault and the garage were finished, those units would be moved back in the location as shown here with all of the foundations either, either on some kind of a structure or partially on a structure, which creates some very strong issues with regards to the stability of, of foundations. So what we've done is we've redesigned the parking garage so that um, all of these units can be moved to permanent foundations one time. Uh, and, and in order to do that, building CNF, which is the, the topic of the, the variance, has to um, be, be moved forward so that, they can clear, that we can clear the construction with adequate space to build the parking garage. The other part of this scenario is building E, which is Cathcart House, and building G on the corner, which is the yellow house, do not move at all. They stay on their original foundations. So in this particular case, we're only moving buildings A, C, B, and F. The main change to, to, to the locations of these, other than shifting them eastward a little bit, is building B used to be behind G, but we wanted to put it out on the streetscape so that it could really be seen. So. Um, so, so it's important that, the, that we get this variance because this is, in, in this way we can actually relocate the four houses, leave two in its place with the redesign of the parking garage. The drainage vault will go in first and then all the houses will be moved while construction takes place on the garage. What that also means is that the restoration of those houses can start almost immediately and not wait for all of the underground construction to be done. Um, in looking at variance findings, there are a bunch of criteria that you need to go through because time is short for the presentation. I'm not going to go through that. If you look at page 20 through 23 of your staff report, these are detailed very carefully by staff. Uh, there is also a justification letter in your packet that shows positive findings can be made for, for granting this variance. In, in terms of site plan, landscaping, and architecture, um, again, we're, we have site plan modification, and I'm going to walk you through the changes to the site plan very quickly with just images. In terms of, of the site plan modification with the historical homes, I already talked to you about their sh shifting uh, location slightly, and the main change is building B being moved um, to the, uh, the streetscape. We just talked about the variance for the two for the two. Um, houses that actually encroach five feet into the, into the setback. We've added elevators and stairwells that come up from the parking garage into the public area so you can park your car, get out of your car, and the entire block becomes a uh, pedestrian-oriented uh, project with the exception of the drop-off pickup area. Um, We've included uh, bike lockers in the basement, and you can go up to the second or third floor in the office building for showers if you want to ride your bike to work. We've created a uh, drop-off pickup area with small spaces that would be at the bottom, and the large area is a uh, loading area that is controlled by ballers for specific times. That area is large enough to, to to carry a um, Cheney Brothers tractor trailer truck that you see all over town. So all of the loading will take place on site and we won't be impacting the surrounding roads. Um, we also put dumpsters internal to the project, air conditioned, actually they're air conditioned compactors so that you won't smell them, you won't see them. You won't have the issue of dumpster enclosures being filled with trash that didn't get into the dumpster. 
Also, there are two restaurants in buildings uh, one and two. Those have internal can wash and mat wash areas, so you won't see any of that on the outside. Um, in, the, in the mechanical area, um, we've also um, included um, FPNL uh, transformer vaults. So you will not see any transformers anywhere on, on the site. They're all internal to buildings um, so that we don't have our, our streetscape cluttered with big transformers. Um, there's also a central um, chiller that is, will provide the air conditioning for the entire site so you won't see um, air conditioning condensers scattered all over the site um, to, to do air conditioning for each of these individual buildings. They'll all be controlled through this one, one chiller. We, we redid the streetscape on all three streets on, on Swinton, First Avenue, First Street. We've added 33 parallel parking spaces and landscape nodes. These spaces are not a part of our um, parking calculation. These are public spaces. Um, we had grading issues on Atlantic Avenue to the tune of about two feet of difference over at the west intersection. We've solved that problem through creating a planter along Atlantic Avenue. We've stepped the building and we've added the porches, which you saw a, a while back, um, which the commission has approved, by the way. Um, in, 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 an, in an effort to make all of these, the, these uh, different units accessible directly from the sidewalk. Also, um, between building two and three, there were floor plate issues where the elevation of the floor plates didn't line up. We've took care of the grading issue on that side and that now is not an issue. Um, there is a mechanical building, which originally was just a walled in area that was open air. And as you can see, all of the buildings around it would have been looking down into that. And that is, is now a, a built, closed building that you can't see into. And we've expanded and improved the, the civic site. Um, also, with regards to the parking garage, the redesign for the, the location of the uh, historical homes has also had us look at, at that. And if you notice on the ends of all of the driving, the parking aisles, there are curved little areas striped out. The previous plan did not have that. We use the auto turn program to make sure that this, this uh, circulation within this garage is, is compatible with vehicles. Also, the yellow square are six uh, electrical vehicle charging stations, and the red is where the bike lockers are that, near the elevator that takes you upstairs to where the showers are in the office building. In terms of proposed uses, the, the building on the left is on the Atlantic Avenue frontage. The first floor is two restaurants with, with retail. The second and third floor are all office space. Going to the right at the bottom of the page, there are two office buildings, buildings nine. Those are all office three stories. Then the mechanical building is, is, uh, is now in added instead of a, just an enclosure. Then, then buildings uh, eight are the three clustered buildings. Um, Peb Capital will be moving their corporate offices into one of these buildings from Boca. Um, the yellow buildings at the top of the page are restaurants for the reuse of the historical homes and the blue will be retail. Um, in terms of the civic site, uh, you've seen uh, the image on the right when we talked about uh, the outdoor dining and there was a comment made about using the civic site for the outdoor dining. What I wanted to show here is the green square is exactly what is required as a civic site for, for this project. If you take the blue square and add it to that, that's a 1500 square foot area that has been that, that we added so that we could be qualified as a plaza. And the peach area is all of the area that we've included, which is just under 2,000 square feet. So when you look at the image on the right, the required civic site has very little infringement upon where the outdoor dining is. Um, this is the, the, uh, the area that, that uh, we're dealing with in terms of the civic site. We had comments from, uh, with regards to the building on the last thing. We've actually gone back to the structural engineers and we have reduced the size of the columns to the, the smallest we can and structurally still support those porches. And also there was a comment about in the middle above the uh, breezeway entry that there were shutters on there before and it was a very good comment. We redesigned the facade of that and we think it's a much improved 
uh, look. And here it is with the landscaping. We've taken a lot of, of uh, trouble to go through and try to make landscaping indicative of what you have on your plans. Um, only because it's very difficult to, to look at the plans and tell what it is. So we're trying to show you images of what the architecture looks like in 3D as well as the landscaping so that you can visualize what those plans uh, actually are. Mm. Um, in terms of the Atlantic Avenue frontage, um, we did elevation changes. We talked about the porches at the last meeting where you saw where the locations of those porches were. Um, we used Cathcart for the inspiration for the railings on that. Um, the previous certified plan had three different building types. Um, we're going with the Anglo-Caribbean for the entire building, but with the addition of the, of the porches. Um, in in the, the entire frontage of Atlantic Avenue, we meet all of the streetscape standards, and the, the red signifies where the clear zones are for the pedestrians. Um, and, and again, going further west, you can see that we, we meet and exceed those, those areas. Um, here is the, the facade of the entire Atlantic Avenue frontage. Um, landscaping has been removed so you can actually see the detailing on the building. And then here it is with the landscaping as per the landscape plan with the street trees. This is looking at the Atlantic Avenue frontage from the other side of, of uh, at First Avenue. Um, so you can see, again, see the, the addition of the porches um, on, on this end as well and the detailing of the building um, and, again, with the landscaping as per the landscape plan. Um, the west side of the building is very difficult to, to understand from the flat plans, elevations of, of this nature. Um, because the building is not actually flat, it's kind of an L-shape, so it's kind of difficult to see where that break is. Um, again, on the First Avenue side, we do comply with all of the, the streetscape standards. Um, this is the, the west side of the, the right-hand leg that actually would front on um, Swinton Avenue of that, of that L-shaped building. Much easier to tell what the building architecture looks like with an image of this nature rather than looking at the flat plans. We tried to translate that and, and give you a realistic view of what that would look like. And then this is the, the, with the, the street trees and the landscaping per the plan. Um, this is another view of, of it from the north side of the Paseo, looking, looking to the north at the, at, the, at the building. Again, if you see the large opening, that's the breezeway entry. We redesigned this side to match the Atlantic Avenue side, uh, and we thought that was a very good suggestion that we got from the last meeting. In terms of the breezeway, um, this is an image of what the breezeway would look like. There's restaurants on either side office space on the second floor looking down. Um, it's, it's open, it's airy, a lot of eyes with natural uh, surveillance. It, it will be a safe, comfortable place to walk to, from the civic site into the Paseo. Um, as far as the elevation on the east side of the buildings fronting Swinton, um, again, this had multiple um, um, Architectural styles, we're, we're sticking with one single style in this proposal. Um, again, we meet all the streetscape uh, standards. And this is an image that shows you the architecture of, of the building. Um, if you see the bollards on the left side, that is the um, service area that we talked about, which when the bollards are, are up and it's not open to, uh, to service vehicles, it becomes a very nice uh, mid-block connection for pedestrians and bicycles to, to get into the Paseo from Swinton Avenue. And there it is with the landscaping as per the, the landscape plan. Um, going south uh, on First Avenue, Building 9, um, some elevation changes. Um, again, um, we feel that this is a better um, um, execution of, of, the, of the architectural style. Again, we are complying with the, the standards for streetscape, even though we're now in the OSHAD section, which does not have streetscape standards. But for consistency, we've tried to do this around the project so that we have a more consistent project and that we're sure that all the sidewalks are, are very accessible. This is the architecture for Buildings 9 uh, on fronting on First Avenue. 
Um, and uh, this would be it with the landscaping, again, as per the landscape plans. Um, and then on the Paseo side of Building 9, um, again, some, some changes to the, the architecture, and this would be what you could actually get. It's very difficult to interpret the, the flat elevation, so we, we tried to get all of the detailing to show the movement of the, of the different planes of the building with all the detail. And then this would be the, the landscaping that would be in the Paseo at this location. Um, the mechanical building originally was approved as a, a walled in area. We've, we've gone with the Anglo-Caribbean style for even though it's a utilitarian building um, that, that uh, to give it some architectural style and blend in. Um, the tower on the right is an elevator and stairwell that goes down into the parking garage. The, the real reason for closing this in was we wanted to have a very clean roof on the building. Um, so that, as you can see, there's many windows above looking down on it. So we wanted to be sure that it was, was not objectionable and you weren't looking down into an open walled area that was full of all kinds of uh, different, different things for, to service the project. Here's a, here's a view from the street in terms of the, the architectural style of that, and here it is with the, the street trees in place. Um, as you go farther south to the intersection of First Avenue and First Street, we're at Building 8. Um, this is looking from First Avenue. Uh, you can see the, the mechanical building in the front because there is another building behind it, and this really demonstrates why we wanted to close the roof in on that because you can see the, the proximity of those buildings. Again, we, we are still maintaining streetscape standards. Um, and, and then as we go around the, the, the corner to First Street, this is the, the view and, and the changes that we're recommending for the architecture. And again, on First Street, we're, we're still honoring the streetscape standards. Here's a, here's a look of, at the architecture of the building from both First Avenue and First Street. First Street would be on the right, First Avenue would be on the left. And, and this is it with the, um, the landscaping. Full disclosure, we went to great pains to try and duplicate all of the, the features of the landscaping where you see the, the purple flowered crepe myrtle, there's actually a power line over top of that. So this is a case of right tree, right place, and it, it didn't get put in, in the rendering, but there is a power line there. We're undergrounding the power lines on First Avenue and the big poles on Swinton are being completely removed and there will be no poles on Swinton Avenue. Um, in terms of building eight in the Paseo view, um, again, this would be the architecture that you would see um, as you from First Street and within the Paseo, and this would be the, the landscaping that would be in indicative of what is on your landscape plans. You've seen these images before. Um, the buildings have been updated since you've seen these, but I just wanted to rem remind you of what the, 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 the walking through the Paseo would, would, would feel like. Um, very nice place to be. Um, then we go to the historical structures. Um, we've evaluated building A, which is the rectory. And as part of your package, we're doing revisions to that, that building. Um, we've added a porch on the back, which is the area with the little white square on top of it. And it's hard to see, but there is a handicap ramp on the right side of that. And you can see it in relationship to that porch and the Paseo. Um, this is the certified plan on the right and on the, on, on the left, I mean, and on the right is a, a picture of the original house. We feel like we should bring that house back to its original look, including the chimney location. The, the, the one change is a handicap ramp that you see on the left side of, of the house. Um, this is the certified plan on the left versus what we're proposing. We think it's a much better application uh, of, of this building. Um, on the back, you, on the left side of the image on the right, you see the porch, which is a duplicate of the, of the porch that's on the front. Um, we feel like that really adds to the, the rear elevation of this and it relates to the Paseo. Um, and here it is in, in 3D in terms of how, how the house would be, be brought back to its original state. That building uh, C is to the left, building 9 is across the courtyard, and again, you can see 
the the loading area that actually acts as the the, the mid block connection for for bicyclists and, and pedestrians when it's not in use as a Mr. service. Cavelli, you you hit twenty minutes, but I want to is this the rest that you have just going through the historic buildings or how much? Um, this is this is pretty much the streetscape. Yeah, so I, I, I'd like to let you. Um, you know, finish through, especially with the, with your historic. That's it. Relocation. <laughs> well That's done. It. Well done. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's quite an accomplishment. I don't know that I'm going to be as... I'll, I'll cut you off, too. ...as prompt. So uh, that was a really lovely presentation, and there were a lot of things that we wanted to copy, but we didn't. We uh... Sorry, before we actually move into the staff presentation, can we just do ex parte communications, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Do we have any ex parte communications, Robert? No. 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 I, I reported the last time we were talking about this project that I did meet with the, the principals of PEB Capital May of 2021, but that was actually before they had uh, much of this design completed. None. I did a drive by. Thank okay. you. Go ahead. Okay, so now you'll start my timer. <laughs> I'm starting. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do my best to move quickly. Uh, so you're familiar with the location of the project. Should we need to refer back to it? I have a location map here that outlines the um, project location, which spans four blocks in the Old School Square Historic District. Block 61, um, which is the large block. That's what we're discussing tonight. Block 62, which is where Sunday House is. Block 69, which is south of uh, Elizabeth's, and Block 70. So 69, 70, and 62 are, there are no modifications proposed um, for that part of the project. So the site contains 6.902 acres. There are 22 structures on the property that were constructed between 1900 and 2001. The rectory and Sunday House are the oldest structures on the property at 1900 and 1902, respectively. Sunday House is on the local register individually listed. This is the local and national historic district map. Um, the project is wholly within the local historic district and um, partially within the national district. You can see the national district runs through the center of block 61, so the west side of it's not included and neither is the block 69 portion of the site. So as uh, we've discussed, or the applicant has discussed as well, it's the entire site is zoned OSHAD, and these highlighted sections are the CBD overlay. So these are OSHAD zoning, but we apply CBD overlay regulations in these areas. This is the proposed site plan, and we will come um, back to this if you have questions. Again, these are the areas where no ch changes are proposed. There is a minor note um, that we are making as an added site plan technical item. It's discussed at the end of the presentation. Building D on this page, this one page in their site plan set is just incorrectly um, illustrated, the location of it. So that needs to be addressed. So here we have the approved and certified site plan. Um, you can see that there's little change between the two. Um, most of what we're dealing with tonight is a modification of the 2018 approval. There's a long developed history in the staff report, which is part of the record. I will not read it as I read some of the history at one of the previous meetings, but it is a very thorough, um, sequential uh, list of where the project's been and how we got to here. So 2018, the project was approved. And when the applicant came in just over two years ago, we've been working with them on this for two years, um, they were developing, they had purchased the property and were developing construction drawings and had quickly come to the understanding that they had a project that construction drawings could not be developed for. So through the process of developing those plans, they started um, looking at modifications to the site plan 
And then looking at the elevations, making adjustments in the approved elevations. So the majority of what we're looking at tonight is in relation to that. You'll also see in your staff report there are um, tables that describe the approved proposal, the approved project versus the proposed project. You can see retail has gone down in square footage, office and restaurant has increased. Um, and then they also are reducing the number of residential type in units that they're going to include on the subject property. The proposal also includes uh, two variances and relocations of four structures, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. I've included the charts that are in the staff report should the board have specific questions, but the request meets the requirements for parking. They are utilizing a shared parking um, a calculation which is permitted per our code and what that means is when you have multiple mixed uses on a single site there are different peak hour times for each of those uses so your residents typically are gone during the day and um, the office workers then come in so these charts are here should you have specific questions they're required 388 parking spaces and they're providing 389, 45 of which will be reserved for the residential portion of the site that's over on 69 and 70, that's a requirement of the code. And then we also have 33 <coughs> parking spaces being constructed on street around the boundary of the proposal. Um, those do not count towards their parking. Here is an illustration from the approved plan of record that shows the underground parking garage on block 61. The red boxes are the houses in their originally approved locations. This is the proposed underground parking garage with modified locations for four structures. I just want to briefly mention that we, um, and we have our transportation planner here tonight should any questions come up. We've worked with the applicant, um, really focusing on looking at things like how is their valet operation going to work? So they've done a valet operation report. And what came out of that is that a median divider, divider diverter um, needs to be constructed on West Atlantic Avenue so that there are no left turns permitted from Northwest or Southwest First Avenue. That's right here at the corner where Dunkin' Donuts is. Uh, so that's part of their project and they've submitted plans illustrating the changes that need to occur um, to manage the traffic so that's properly distributed on the surrounding road network. So they meet the requirements for bike parking. I thought this was interesting for a project this large. We really have quite a requirement for bicycle parking. As the applicant said, they are including shower facilities uh, in their office building. They far exceed the requirements for civic open space. Civic open space is only applicable to the CBD portions of the site. So that's the front piece that's up on Atlantic and then the block 69 and 70 pieces. Um, the 61, block 61 portion of the site, they're required 591 square feet and they're providing 1,990 square feet. You'll remember this is where the um, outdoor dining is located. So I'll just uh, note here, and you'll see that in your staff report, the proposal can be found to be in compliance with the LDRs in relation to zoning, supplemental, and development standards uh, relating to these items we just discussed. This is for reference purpose, should we need to come back to it, but this is also in the plan set. Um, their proposed site elements, street furniture, and hardscaping. Here we have their proposed landscape plan, um, which is also in your staff report, or in your um, attachments to your staff report. And I've included the approved tree removal plan because there's some history that we've discussed in the staff report in relation to removal of trees. So the original project approval included um, relocation of trees on site, relocation of trees off-site, removal of trees. The trees that were supposed to be relocated off-site were actually removed from the site. 
the applicant went to the special magistrate who um, ordered them to come to HPB and process a modification to correct that, which is part of this submittal. So they have a mitigation plan that they've included along with the updated tree disposition plan. With the original approval, they were required to um, submit a payment in the amount of $139,800 for the trees that were approved to be removed originally. With the trees that were removed most recently in error, an additional payment of $118,025 is required to be submitted to the tree trust fund. Uh, that would be a total for this project of $258,307 paid into that fund. This item is attached as a site plan condition of a um, site plan technical item. But here, it's gone through an extensive review with our landscape team. Um, this, the landscape can be found to meet the requirements of the LDRs. I've included some snapshots should we wish to discuss this, but I'm going to move quickly. These are developed streetscape studies. We've got so many more. I included um, just a few. What these images show is the positioning of the building, the landscaping, the tr street trees. Uh, this requirement is applicable to the CBD, but the applicant went ahead and developed streetscape studies for the entire Block 61 portion of the site so that we could see that there was consistency up and down the block, not just planting trees on the, on the CBD portion. Um, so that, was, that really helped in um, our understanding of, in our review. So these, uh, the next two items, variance and relocation, how am I on time? Um, we're gonna, I'm going to probably talk together. Right at 10 minutes. So there was a variance request for which a public notice was mailed to everybody in the, in the 500 foot area that owned property, um, notifying them of the request. In the old school square historic arts district, the front setback requirement is 25 feet and they're asking for a 20 foot um, front setback, so a five foot reduction. And you can see, we have a few graphics here so that you can see this is applicable only to building C and F. Um, a big portion of their shift in the relocations of the structures was, and you'll see through the analysis in the staff report, was multi-part. To not have the structures on top of the parking garage as they were originally approved, and also to not have them in the temporary staging area. So the original approval had the homes being picked up, shifted east in a temporary mm -hmm. spot, and then moving back after the garage was constructed, which could be at, you know a year. We've seen some of these underground parking garages take quite a bit of time. Um, staff had a lot of concern about that. We expressed that with the original request. Um, they also revised the location of the underground drainage vault which handles the storage of on-site drainage so that it was in a single area rather than um, sprinkled around the structures. And that's what you see here. These are the two buildings here, looking at them from a streetscape perspective. Um, and when I talk about the relocations, we'll have a better understanding of that shift. So here are the variance findings and the staff report um, you have in front of you indicates that positive findings can be made. The relocation, we have this included in the staff report as well. This is the very dialed in how many feet east, how many feet south are these structures moving. Um, what you see here is the existing structure plan. So this is the current location of all of the structures on site. This was part of the Midtown Del Rey approval from 2018. This is the approved temporary plan. So the uh, blue section or the blue structures that you see um, right here, this was their holding area basically. They were going to be sitting on lifts and secured and waiting in that position before they could be moved back to be rehabilitated. So the current request, um, here you'll see building A shifts to the east and south, building C also east and south, 
Building B um, is moving from an approved location behind G over to the north side of F. And F is shifting north and east. I, I keep saying north and south, but they're all shifting to the east, whether it's north or south. So these are the four structures that are subject to the relocation. C and F are the two that are subject to the variance. So uh, part of the description that the applicant has explained to us is in order to build the parking garage and put piled in the, in the ground, those structures need to move. So they either move and sit temporarily east on the property or they can move them to a permanent location. So they'll move to that location and that will be their location. There's no second move. That will also facilitate these structures being rehabilitated as soon as the project starts rather than having to wait a year or so for their rehabilitation and fixing them up. This is just a, a zoomed in look. The brown building, which is Cathcart on the left, and building G on the right, which I think we call the yellow house, um, are not moving at all. So Cathcart originally was going to move. It's not moving at all. The green ones over on the right here, those are being moved to the Sunday house or reconstructed as the original plan approved. So you'll see a note here, the approved certified plan included plans to have plaques throughout the site that um, describe the history of the structures and the history of the, any relocations that were happening. Um, so we have a few photographs and alongside of the rendering from the applicant where you can see that signage where the programming for those plaques could be included. So it is their plan to um, include a history throughout the site and honor the history of the site and South Swinton Avenue. The relocation criteria is here. It's also in your staff report. Relocation criteria is similar to a finding. Uh, this is what the board shall be guided by when making a decision on the relocation. And the staff report indicates that um, the criteria can be found to be met by the proposal. Building A, the rectory, is proposed for an addition and modification. Um, those modifications bring the building back to a more historic appearance with a chimney adjustment and the wraparound porch being adjusted. Here you can see the porch in the bottom images. Um, the image on the left, the por back porch is on the right. The image on the right, the back porch is on the left. This will activate the rear of the property along the pedestrian paseo. And I have these here should we need to discuss them, but the, um, these structures are fundamentally remaining as they exist today with um, maintenance and improvements to things, particularly um, maintenance, rehabilitation, and conversion to commercial for those that have been residential like the Cathcart House. The Coquina wall comes up a lot in conversation on this project, so I thought I'd just put a picture in. It is going to be um, st removed, stored, um, rehabilitated, and reinstalled, as are the railings, which I took this photograph. They are already inside of the Cathcart house, being kept from the elements. And these are a few more photographs. Now I want to move into the... Um, you saw beautiful renderings from the applicant. We can come back to those during board discussions should you have questions. But here we've provided before and after. Um, you can see that the massing is um, generally the same and it's a little bit smaller in some instances over the original approval. The big change um, in the overall project, you see on the left side of your screen here, that's building one and two which we see here. The original approval included Mediterranean Revival, Anglo-Caribbean, and Art Deco. So three architectural styles utilized in one structure that had to get approval. Um, and the applicant has looked to the Cathcart House to take inspiration from that structure to come up with a design that is more cohesive and compatible with the district and the property. So what we see below is still the Anglo-Caribbean, but with the French colonial inspiration that 
uh, the Cathcart House provides through the use of porches. The upper story porches and balconies are functioning. You can walk out onto them, uh, French doors. We've got the um, structural parapets that come up over there on the right side and through the pedestrian pass through. So it was a exercise in really making an adjustment to the front of the building, also to address that grade differentiation issue that the applicant um, discussed. So these are, you know, several images of the same building, all of different sides, so you can take a look at that. And this is the, um, where is it here? The courtyard view. Uh, so if you're standing from the west looking into the valet parking lot, this is what you would be facing. So it's all sides of the building are being treated. There are no, no backs, essentially. And here we've got um, this approved versus proposed streetscape elevations. The other buildings on the site, which are called buildings eight and nine, and there's three building eights and two building nines, um, their architecture is shifting but again, the massing is generally the same, if not smaller in some situations. Uh, you can see on the bottom drawing here, there's a staircase that was accessibility issues that weren't developed with the previous approval. I uh, just want to come back um, to this image here. Um, actually, it's this one, it's hard to see. But some of the shifts that have been occurring here in this proposal, here it is, involve really um, developing the Anglo-Caribbean style a little bit further where you see the, um, the balconies have this structural balcony wall, decorative um, siding. The windows are, are more in scale with the architecture of the building. They aren't just a swath of storefront windows. Um, awnings have been incorporated. It's just really well thought out execution of the style. This I want to take a moment to discuss the mechanical building, which was a yard and now is a building. And I think it's wonderful that the applicant is saying that they uh, are air conditioning the refuse container areas. Um, we're really glad to hear that. Um, because we did not want to see a pedestrian situation walking past dumpster enclosures, um, can wash areas. So they, they really worked hard to develop that plan. The mechanical building now has an architectural style to it. These are, um, for your reference, the Secretary of the Interior Standards are also in your staff report. Um, the DDA and the Community Redevelopment Agency both have seen this. The DDA recommended approval. Um, I'm right at the end, so I want to make sure I didn't miss anything, but we can always circle back during board discussion. Oh, the site plan technical items. Uh, here are the findings for the COA, the site plan, and the architectural elevations. And the site plan technical items, you'll see that there are 15 in the staff report. We have two additional. Um, you don't need to read this into the record, but now at the meeting we've brought this up. We'll include it with um, the project should, should the board move to approve that the site plan be revised to correctly illustrate the location of building D and that we get the utility provider notices from the utility providers. There are a few that are missing, um, but generally these are house cleaning items that need to be done after a project's approved. So we have some agreements that need to be completed and plan edits that need to be um, followed through should the project get approved. Wow, I don't know how close I was to 20 minutes. 22, not too bad. Um, so thank you, that concludes my presentation. Um, I think we're at public comment, right? Yeah, is there any public comments? Everybody else, I guess somebody should say something. <laughs> George Long, 46 North Swinton. I, I got the notice, I'm within 500 feet. 
I have a lot, some history with that property. I used to walk along that cocaine uh, wall with the uh, young Dr. Vogler's daughter when we were 10, 12 years old. And so I'm glad you're putting it back. Brings back fond memories. Um, I see no problem with the variance as long as it has a good reason. Is there a good reason there? That's up to you. Sounds good to me. Thank you. Hello, John Miller, 1502 Fenton Drive, Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, ask chair. Mr. Miller, have you actually, have you been sworn in? Yes. Okay, great. Yep, that was earlier. Okay, thanks. Uh, past chair of this board twice, past chair of PNZ, and currently president of the historical, uh, Delray Beach Historical Society. Um, I was vehemently against this project back in the day, 2017, 2018. Um, if it came up again today, I'd probably still be against it. I think it's too big, too massive, and it disrespects the OSHAD Historic District. However, that ship has sailed. Uh, it was passed, and I think this plan is vastly improved over what we saw last time. So I think it treats the uh, historic structures with respect. I'm glad they're staying on solid ground, not over a parking garage. Um, I think Roger did a great job consulting on the architecture. I think it's uh, much better than the three mishmash styles that were there previously. Um, you know, I think the variances are very well, uh, that's why you have a, a variance, why you grant a variance, so you can take care of the historic structure and make moves that are appropriate to those buildings without putting them in danger. So I'm, I'm for the, the variance as well. So overall, yeah, I, I, not much to complain about. I'm glad I saw the whole thing. Um, much improved over the, the last go around uh, many years ago and um, I'm in support of it. Thank you. If there's no other public comment, is there any cross-examination from staff or from the applicant or for staff or for the applicant? I have none. I have none. Okay. Move right into board discussion. Sorry, you said rebuttal as well too, right? No rebuttal. No rebuttal. No rebuttal. Thank you. Um, so... One of the items that, um, it, okay, so first, I was on the board when we denied this project um, three times, and it was finally approved by city commission. So I have a great deal of history with this. I love the, the new development of the architecture. It makes so much more sense and all the different styles that were combined into one building. Um, I love the fact that they uh, have dealt with the grading, which most people didn't seem to really understand, but in the previous plan, you had to walk up and down steps to get into the development. It was not street friendly, sidewalk friendly. Uh, it separated itself from the rest of the city. Um, have I don't see any objections to the variances I think that it makes a lot of sense for them to be uh, able to move these historic structures onto their permanent locations um, you know in a perfect world we wouldn't move them but I think that they have treated this move very delicately I think they put a lot of thought and energy into creating a uh, a semblance of the streetscape that we currently have in our historic district and they've kept all of that on Swinton which is where it currently is. There were a couple of things that I wanted to clarify with the with um, uh, Michelle. Um, in looking at the structures that are being moved I saw several incidences where um, window styles had been changed Openings were different sizes, uh, where there were two windows, then it became three. Uh, and I don't know if you had already addressed those 
and those were done for specific reasons. Uh, but I was just wondering about that. Um, for, that was, uh, F was one of them in particular. Um, you've changed the style of the windows. Maybe you changed it for a good reason. But we didn't have any of that really. None of the report was dedicated to that. So I do think that we should consider because, yes, we want to see the new building. And yes, that's really important. but. One of our main goals on this board is to preserve the history, and that would be the village part. That is the older structures. So we need to take primary importance to these historic structures that they're moving. And one of the things that we always do is we look at the voids and the solids and the, the details of these older buildings. And I, I, it just seemed like they had changed a lot. I just wanted to confirm that I, I was correct and not misunderstanding. Um, and it is a bit misleading with a slide where you see existing and proposed. Well, I took pictures on my phone and, and put them side by side. And so yeah. I did try so to do some So these were of that. already approved. Pardon me? This, these changes that you see, other than the rectory, were already approved. So that all went, was a city commission approval from long ago. The, these are from the original approved set of plans, and I apologize. Okay. I probably could have clarified that instead of saying proposed. I could have said approved, but in this instance, um, we wanted to show the, the relocations, what was happening with the rehabilitation. So. I understand your primary importance tonight, and, and it is there, like, some of these, like the window styles changed from a that's three over already, one to a... That's already part of the 2018 approval. Okay. It's not subject to the request, which is why in the staff report, we were only addressing the rectory, Building A. I see. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you. That's all I had to say. I, I would, uh, I see a good reason to grant the variance. Jim? Uh, just to follow on to, to that question, the other blocks in this project have already been approved or is there yes. more that's going to, so this is. So I'll, I'll just the, go back to that because I expected um, that you all might have questions. It's um, quite a large project, so um, this is the slide here. Um, sorry. Where is it? These here that are grayed out, these have all written, the whole project was approved in 2018 by the city commission. Um, these grayed out parcels here are 69, 70, and 62. There's no changes proposed. So the, as it was approved is how it will continue and will become part of this project approval. Um, they're just carried forward. The only modifications being considered are on the large block, which is block 61, um, that you see with the blue and yellow color um, structures here. The little red, just because I don't remember if I said this, those are el new elevator shafts and stairways that connect from the ground level at the pedestrian level to down underground to the garage. So we're only focusing on block 61. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, what uh, what steps are being taken to preserve the historic buildings as they are moved? I think we have some history in, in Delray where the move is more dangerous to the buildings uh, than maybe 50 or 75 years worth of weather. Uh, I know of a couple of those on Swinton. I'm sure John remembers well. Uh, what, what safety regards or steps are being taken to make sure that particularly those wooden buildings uh, with very weak foundations, what 
what are we doing on that? So on page 22 in your staff report okay. is a it begins the analysis for the relocation and that continues to page 25. I included the entire code section here for the board's mm -hmm. reference along with analysis. The applicant has submitted updated structural assessments from 2017 timeframe that tell us what's happened in the last four or five years. Um, wood buildings are easier to move than masonry buildings. So that, that is a consideration. They have a number of things to comply with with the code, including if you um, in the site plan technical items is the requirement for a historic structure relocation bond. So they have to submit bonds for each of the structures um, it, an, um, an amount equal to 125% of the value, fair market value of those structures. Um, they also have to include a letter of credit. So there are some fail safes built into the code when moving a building um, that anybody have, has to comply with. And any other details the applicant can respond to? Sure, and the applicant could certainly respond as well if if you have further questions for them um, but you'll see it's part of the relocation there's a series of items that they come forth with and we look at we had comments on their first structural assessment and said tell us more so they updated that structural assessment so that we had a complete snapshot is the foundation in good shape uh, is the building going to survive a move? What should the contractor be paying attention to when he comes out to do the move? What sections maybe need to be um, fortified? So it, it's quite a process beyond just the board saying, hey, we approve it. Um, but I'd be happy to, if you have questions for the applicant, you could talk to them in more depth. You've, you've told me what I wanted to hear in terms okay. of securing the building. Um, the uh, the loading dock uh, or the loading area and uh, the architect uh, talked about uh, handling 16 wheelers coming in there my question is how do they get out do they back out onto swinton I'm, I'm so glad you asked these questions because we've painstakingly asked these questions over two years well, you prompted um, me to ask these questions, right? I'm glad you did. <laughs> so the applicant, um, we asked that same question. How are you going to actually utilize this loading court? Um, and they provided an auto turn analysis. Um, so we, we did study the auto turn analysis. So they will enter off of Southwest First Avenue and exit onto Swinton Avenue, making a left or right. The trucks are 44 foot long, I believe the auto turn was designed for. Um, so they can enter and exit the site in a forward manner without encroaching onto curbs or um, hitting any kind of street trees or street signs. Um, Mr. Cavelli, I can hear, is behind me. So if you <laughs> want to t discuss with him as well, um, he could tell you more about the loading court. Okay, I'd like to hear that. I've just seen. So, uh, so many accidents there and uh, trucks going over the curb uh, right there on Swinton and Atlantic. I'd love to hear it. Let's give me, okay, I guess I'll find it. Oh, you it's, wanna? It's up near the beginning. Go like this here. I meant to put the auto turn in here. Do you have it? Um, I'll let you go from right, here. Go. Okay, let me find you, get, the, get you to a slide here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not working. Why are we not working, Michelle? There we go. There we go. I guess this this will be a, a, a good good way to, to show it. Um, if you remember, there was an abandonment of um, oops, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. Sorry, of the the alley that went up like this and then it curved around and I and I believe that there was an, also a connection this way. 
what what we've done is we've we've kind of brought that back but but on a controlled basis um so at let's see if i can get it right there you can see the line of dots those are bollards that are movable and out near the street there's another set so what we've done is we've we've created this as a one-way uh, service drive so you would enter at the south down here and you can the truck can has proper radio eye so you can come up go this way the ballers will be be down and then there's a hundred feet of storage area in this area where the, the trucks can stage and, and load and unload when when they complete what they need to do they exit on the Swinton Avenue so the, the idea of this was, and, and in order to do that, they, there's enough room that they can actually make the turn. And we did, um, we, we did the auto turn um, evaluations on all of this for um, a WB40 truck, which is the 16-wheeler that, that, that you speak of, that you see all over town parked in the middle of the street usually. But we've done it so we couldn't do that. Um, in addition, we did auto turn in terms of this radius so that we're sure that that is adequate for like FedEx trucks, uh, UPS, all of those kinds of trucks, uh, small box trucks, that they can actually come in and make that turn and actually exit. So we have, have loading uh, evaluated very carefully um, so that we don't have an issue. Um, this being a fully managed uh, project that is own, owner operated where their offices are actually going to be in here that it gives them great control over when those those uh, deliveries and pickups take take place in addition this you see this little box in the side of the building that's where where one of the dumpsters is and that that area will also be used for emptying the compactors um, so again all of the that trash situation is, is is handled within that service drive as well so we're not on the street for for that for that and waste management can get in there or yes. whomever the contractor may be we, we've had multiple meetings with waste management in terms of sizing the compactors and how much room they need and and, and all of the the geometry of of doing that i've got a couple related questions and one is why, and I guess this is really a question of the city, but it's the same sort of theme. Why would you let an 18-wheeler turn left onto Swinton? Where else can they go but to then go up to Atlantic and turn left again? You don't want it coming down Swinton. Well, because, it could go, it could because you can't make the turning radius coming off of Swinton. I mean, we've we've evaluated this very yeah. carefully um, in, in terms of how you access this. On second or first, you couldn't make that turn. Um, on if if you turn right here and go down to first or to second, turn right and go south. You mean? Yeah. Um, you can do that, but you have to cross the center line to do it to go south. And you don't have to cross the center line. Like um, no. Left turn. Well, you you cross the center line to yeah. go north naturally. Yeah. So. Um, and you and took it, into account the parallel parking across. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we did. All right. Uh, similar question. Uh -huh. uh, last night, the city presented uh, the traffic plan for that intersection, mm -hmm. and it's. Taking out, if I remember correctly, I'm sure Anthea or Brian can straighten me out, but taking out the right-hand turn off of Atlantic onto Swinton, and if I heard you correctly, you show a right-hand turn at that location. We're showing the existing lane configuration as it is today. Um, we, we, you know, in, in, in terms of the plat, there's no additional right-of-way needed. That we're currently doing, uh, as far as I'm concerned, under, understand to to accommodate that. Um, it it doesn't really affect what what we're doing. Our our primary access will actually be off of Atlantic um, at First Avenue. We can address that too. Okay. Brian. So 
<clears throat> Brian Risher, City Transportation um, Planner and Development Services with Anthea and um, Michelle. Last night, um, the presentation that uh, you're referring to, Jim, is for the Urban Core Mobility Study. That's looking at all the development projects within the proximity of basically this site. You know, anything that has a transportation performance standards letter from the county. Um, so you have a lot of different things happening there. What, we're, what we've asked the applicant to do is look at the valet operations and how it relates specifically to um, the movements. What they've come up with is what you see in the proposed site plan with the directional median diverter. Um, the, so the study that you were referring to last night has a little bit more um, information included within it. We didn't lean on the applicant to incorporate all of those different development approvals simply because it didn't relate to the valley operations specifically. The city might come in later at, at a later time make those improvements as they're required to help facilitate the traffic movement and other developments come online. Well, I'm just I'm just concerned that one hand is talking to the other here and that if in Mike's plan there is a right hand turn around that that plaza and your plan there is not, how do we reconcile that and not have to worry about it 10 years from now? Well, I think with respect to um, this development approval in particular, the requirements that the city staff have requested um, are consistent with what would be necessary to make their site work and at one point in time. Um, I think it's a really great effort for, for what it's worth for public works and development services to have you know basically requested the applicant come to come back to the table with us because this was something that wasn't approved before um, with respect and what they're um, willing to do with the, the changes that are coming with the changes of use and the other operational characteristics of operating restaurants. Um, it's just some of the natures that I think that we've come to as a city. Um, the city is working still. Um, our team has a really active looking at the transportation, not just for the urban core at Atlantic and Swinton, but also throughout the entire downtown. Sure. So we are working collaboratively on this. Um, and as developments come in, frankly, if we get an approved and adopted plans sooner, we are able to implement these changes more through development as, as we're allowed to. But because we don't have an adopted plan, um, this development is being held to what they're requiring for with respect to valet. I think I understood that. Okay. It was a long answer, but I'm here for others. Um, if I can also note, um, thank you so much, Brian. Um, the property owner and their team is aware of all of that, and they have been in contact with Public Works themselves as well to keep apprised okay. of the changes that potentially would be coming. And one of the things that they're going to go ahead and incorporate now as part of the project is straightening the crosswalk from the west side of Swinton to the east side of Swinton. So mm -hmm. from, from west to east. They've committed to making that update in the interim until the, the full plan is developed. Um, but we've had a lot of conversations through the topic you're bringing up right yeah. now. And, and we've discussed it with another project that's coming down the pipeline here soon, too, that's in process. So, Well, and the, the whole idea of diverting down southwest first to enter rather than going around to Swinton is, I think, a great idea. Um, the parking garage. Uh, I think that's a phenomenal commitment on the part of the, the uh, owner and developer there because having a parking lot on Main and Main in your street is not a, or in your town is not a good idea. But I'm wondering about this as, as somebody who uses the municipal garage in, uh, at Old School Square quite a bit. The size of vehicles is changing so much. <laughs> and either an SUV taking up one and a half parking slots or a pickup truck that comes halfway into the drive lane. Are those things that were taken into account in the planning? Um, in, in terms of the, the parking sizes, is that what you're referring to? Well, I'm ter um, the turn angles, the, the uh, travel widths, the slots that mm -hmm. cars go into right um, the 
you know, the... Does it handle an, an F-350 pickup truck? It, it's not going to probably handle that. Um, you know, if you look at, like, a regular SUV, um, like a... What, what is it? Like a Chevy Tahoe or something like that. Um, that will fit no problem. Um, you know, they looked at one of the bigger vehicles in terms of doing the, the, the turning movements in there. Um, greatly improved over the current approved plan. Um, you know, we did, did provide the radius areas. Um, and see if I can show you that plan. This was going to be a valet, right? A valet operation? Um, part of it is, well, let's see, where is that? I lost it. I went too far. I'm going the wrong direction. This is, sorry, very much. I'm sorry. Um, there. Um, if, you, if you look at, like, the ends of these parking areas, you can see the, the, the radius areas on the ends of yeah. all of these. Those did not exist on the other one. They were straight, and the driving aisles were much narrower. So there's a, and they're just striped out areas, so they're not barriers. So there's a much better um, buffer, if you will, in terms of maneuvering area in between all of these, these driving aisles than in, in the, the, the previous plan. Um, That's good. Which, you know, if you look at this plan, you'll see on the ends of these aisles, there are, you know, there are no, um, there's no radius, any kind of radius on the ends of them. They're just squared off. So, so we've built in that buffer for a bigger vehicle to be able to maneuver through there. I'll just take two more questions. Is that all right? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, he's good. Parallel parking on the street. Yes. Why? Um, I'm thinking particularly of, of uh, First Street there. Mm -hmm. With all of the investment in the parking garage and the turning, just to get three or four cars to park on the street, which could be sidewalks, it could be trees. Uh, we, we talked about this, I think, in the, in the last meeting. And, and uh, the the agreement was not to talk then, but to talk about it now. And I don't, I, I couldn't see if there are any on Swinton. Um, there are on Swinton all, as well. Um, what what we've done is we've looked at at the streetscape of all three roads. Obviously, we can't do it on Atlantic, but when you look at at this plan, you can actually see where the, the parallel parking is and where the landscape nodes are. What what it does is it it brings the the sidewalks to a more human scale you have more landscaping on the street side when you have the when you have the landscape nodes and and the parallel parking actually starts creates kind of a buffer for for people on the sidewalk as well so from from the drive lane so you know in terms of that we felt that that, that is is a much better streetscape. It's it's has a much better look. It 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 fits the 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 standard. It helps slow traffic down. Um, there's a lot of reasons. I, I know Brian's here. He can probably speak to, to those kinds of things as well. But um, when we initially looked at this, there's you, you know there, there's some spaces on Swinton Avenue. They're not really laid out really well. So we decided that we would. Since we were trying to carry the streetscape from Atlantic Avenue through and around the project, that we would continue that that parking in the landscape nodes as well. I might debate with you on some of those <laughs> <laughs> another basis. I mean, I, I think that uh, probably overarching trees are proven to slow down traffic yeah. more than uh, automobiles parked in parallel. But uh, I'm I'm just saying it would be. From my standpoint, uh, something that w we could consider. Um, and just one other thing, the power poles that are going to be taken away, has FPL already agreed to that? Because mm -hmm. they just put them in, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, what, what we're doing is we're working to reroute the lines on Swinton Avenue. So those poles will actually come down. Um, and the line will run east and west on 1st. And it will go to 
Block 69, where the, the, where the new alley is going to con continue south to First Street from behind the Federspiel garage. Right now it comes down and makes a 90 degree to the right. east. We are in for permit to actually take that east leg out and, put, and continue the alley south. The, the power lines that are behind the garage will be connected to that as a way of getting power north and south in the alley rather than on Swinton Avenue. So those lines are just going to be completely removed. We've got a couple of issues we're working out because there's a, an irrigation uh, street light box that, that is part of that. And I think at the north end, there's some power that we have to reroute for the signal. But, but eventually, those big giant poles are actually going to come out of there, and there will be no, no lines on, on Swinton. We just got approval from the commission to actually run conduit along the west side of First Avenue. Okay. So from the north side of the entry where the library is, um, there will be undergrounding of, of the, the, the power all the way down the west side of, of First Avenue down to First that's, Street. That's great. Yeah, and, and by putting it on the west side of the street, what it did was it gives us the ability to plant real trees on yeah. the First Avenue frontage because we don't have any conflict with that. So that was a lot of work to get that done and have the city cooperate to let us put that in the right of way. It sounds like a lot of work. Huh? It was. And you're also going to capture all that water underground and recycle that? Um, like a it, cistern system? It goes into a, um, in a, into a storm vault system. That, that is open on the bottom and it ultimately just recharges the groundwater. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just to follow up on your comments about underground parking, um, how deep is your, what's the, the how deep are you going with your parking garage? Um, I, I think the, the clearance is eight feet. How about, um, yeah, uh, do you? Um, I, I, in this in this area, we we looked at what the groundwater was, and I think the groundwater is like ten feet down. So I think the only place where we're going to have any any interference with groundwater is the, not going to be like that other garage. Um, it's going to <laughs> we, where we have the thickened um, foundations. Parts of that will actually touch the water table, but the rest of it is not in the water table. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, that's exactly because I, I see on the drawing it says underground parking, which is okay. often a misnomer. It's usually underwater parking. And, yes. Yes. And, you know, the We've, just having we, hmm. having built some of these bathtubs myself, I, I will tell you that the long-term sustainability of right. underground parking below the water table is is not good. Right. We've looked at that very carefully. Especially if you're trying to rely on recharging the water table out of your on the other you know, side area, right, right adjacent to that. I just don't know how that works, but right. you know, your civil engineers could probably figure that out. Um, I want to go back to something that um, that Rhonda had touched on that um, procedurally. I, I know that you've got um, approved uh, plans from the previous go around on the historic buildings. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm questioning if it would, you know, I, I don't want to sound like uh, an overreach, but um, if there was some way that we could get another look at those as like a courtesy um, procedure to, to really to really go through, because we have this this stat or this, this board has not ever really looked at those individual buildings, and I know we've got it. We've got a applicant who proven that they you know they're they're willing to to do the right things how, how would how would we go about doing that could is that something we could ask no so <laughs> I'm, i really wish kelly hadn't walked out of the room at this moment because she she and i discussed this um i thought maybe she was coming in she and i discussed this before the meeting tonight um what purview does the board have certainly the applicant could come back to the board with some modifications, minor modifications to those structures if they wish. But as um, those structures are not proposed to be changed as part of this application, it's not subject to that modification. I think some of the comments you were looking at, if we looked at building F, I don't know if, if Kelly wants to chime in, we're talking about um, 
Mr. Baffer is asked if the applicant could come back to the board with some modifications to the historic structures with which was already approved and isn't subject to modification. Um, and I've explained that they potentially could come in and their own request, you know, on their own to do a good faith, but that technically you and I discussed this earlier, anything that's not changing over the original modification um, that the board wouldn't have purview to go back on. Yeah, Michelle's has actually stated it perfectly. I don't know that I've too much more to add to that, but right now you're you're looking at the modifications that they've chose to put in there, um, and the variances, not um, going back on things that have already been approved in the prior site plan in 2018. Well, then why, said, is, why is that different than Block 61? Block 61, they the this applicant has an approved plan from 2018. They could go out and build that right now. Yes, Correct, but they're bringing forward the modifications that you're reviewing now. So it's either the modifications, you're looking at the modifications versus the approved plan rather than the approved plan in its entirety. Does that make sense? But I do hear the applicant, um, I can hear Mike behind me and I'm guessing he might um, want to address the board on that. Some of the things that may have been of concern, I, I think you addressed some window mutton pattern changes. Mm -hmm. um, for building F, windows. building F is a bungalow style structure, so a three over one would be completely appropriate for um, those, which is what was approved. But perhaps we could let Mr. Cavelli speak and um, give you a, an idea of what the applicant might be interested in doing. Basically, I'll, I'll just make one more comment. Basically, the board doesn't have the authority to go back and change something that's already been approved, except for the fact that he's bringing forward specific modifications, and you can make your recommendations on those modifications specifically. If I may. Um, when PEB bought this project, they thought they were buying a shovel-ready product. And as we got into construction drawings, we found out very quickly that there were a lot of constructability issues wrong with this project in, in terms of elevations, in terms of foundations, in terms of just, you know, all you have to do is go out and look at Cathcart House. Um, we looked into the history of Cathcart, you know, it had a wooden porch. They replaced that porch three times, I think they said, because it kept rotting out. And then, then the last version, they poured a concrete slab. I'm not even sure if you, you really could safely move that with that concrete slab and not lose the porch. So, you know, in our evaluation of this, we, we decided that we really needed to not take the chance of, of losing Cathcart House. And as a bonus, Building G, the yellow house on the corner, also didn't have to move. The, the goal of this is to get to work. You know, we've, we've worked on this for two years. And, and, and I will tell you that we're looking at the other blocks and there are constructability issues on those blocks as well. So most likely you're gonna see those in the future with modifications of those plans. The, the goal for, for this plan right now is so that we can get approval, get the, the houses moved and put on permanent structures, start that restoration, <clears throat> and most importantly, start the construction of the project because it's been two years when we thought we were going to go to work right after purchase. Building A was brought to you because there's a tenant in Building A and and that's an adaptive reuse of that building to to accommodate a tenant. We don't have any tenants in the other buildings yet but we are talking to people there's already a lot of interest. Most likely we're going to be back in, in front of you with, with those buildings one way or another. Right now, the site plan designates each of those buildings as a specific use. If someone takes the building we, we represented as a restaurant and they want to change it to a shop, then we'll be back in with a, with a class three change of use plan and, and, and a detailed plan for that. Um, as we get into the restoration of, uh, of these buildings, uh, we, we're most likely going to have to evaluate all of them because like in building, building A, the rectory that you saw tonight, we had to add a handicap ramp for accessibility issues. We're gonna have to do that on all these buildings. So 
you know, can you make me do it tonight? No. <laughs> Are we probably going to bring those back? Yes. Because as we get into the adaptive reuse, we're going to have to make them ADA compliant and we're going to have to make changes to those buildings in order to do that. May I ask a question? Kelly, we can't require it, but isn't there a legal mechanism where we can request it? There's not, because those specific portions of the plans are not up for review at all. So um, unless, he, unless they were bringing it as part of their site plan request, it's, it's not within your realm of authority at this point. Well, that's why I tried to make a distinction between require and request. I understand. The, the applicant would have to. It's still outside the scope of the site plan that's before you. May I? So sure. I, this segues right into what you were just saying, you want to get started. What is the time frame for this project? This has been obviously five years. Uh, you guys have owned it, obviously. Oh. <laughs> so what, what are we? If, if you're approved tonight, like what, what is the, are we doing it in one phase, several phases? What's the first step? All of building of block 61 will happen at the same time. Okay. Um, and we actually already have all the structural plans completed. We're doing that at risk. Um, I believe we've already filed those with the building department for, for, to start the review. Um, and, and so we're, we're, really anxious to get started as, as fast as we can uh, to get this, pro this part of this project moving. Um, we're looking at the other blocks. Um, you most likely will see every one of those blocks with revisions for constructability issues, just like we're doing here. It's, it's just a process of sequence of construction that we have to go through to, to get the project moving. Yes, and, and we actually did submit in, in, your, in your package, there is a sequencing plan in there that, that spells out all of the construction sequencing. I don't think I sent it to them. You know, they don't have it? I don't think so. Oh, God. Exactly. <laughs> Michelle thinks it isn't in your plan. But we did do a very detailed, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry no, for looking at you through the window here. I know. But, but we did do a very detailed uh, construction sequencing plan that deals with utility relocations, all of the, the sequences for building the project. You can ask Michelle to, to see a copy of that if you really want to dig into it. We've, we've really thought it through. Then one more question. Um, you probably can answer this. When the vehicles exit the garage, mm -hmm. will they go directly to Southwest first or Atlantic? We're going to provide signage that, that directs people that if you want to go east, you can go to Atlantic to go east. You can't go west on Atlantic with the modification to the median. Okay. And anybody that's tried to go across that has got to be crazy to try it anyway. <laughs> um, and, and, but um, if you want to go south or west, um, you would go down to First Street, and you would either go east or west, depending on which direction you want to go. I just wanted to note that that is a site plan technical item. So that is, um, item number eight, that a wayfinding signage plan relating to site circulation be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit for vertical construction mm -hmm. on Block 61 and installed before CO, that is exactly what you're talking about, right. our, the valet study that they provided, the analysis that Mr. Ruscher, our transportation planner did, um, said you've got to have some kind of wayfinding um, for the public so that you don't create a stacking issue at the, at the intersection of First and Atlantic. More than what we have now. Right. Yeah, yeah. and the plan that Mr. Chard had inquired about potentially, um, you know, whatever changes happen at this intersection, mm -hmm there will likely be wayfinding associated with that plan too right. to how to navigate this intersection into the downtown so i guess for board discussion um you know i've been i was involved in this in 2018 too but i was just a public I was but i sat here i think it was still 2 a.m or something or one of those meetings again i was vehemently opposed to this but that ship has sailed so 
in seeing this, this is the best modification that I believe. I mean, you guys may agree or disagree, especially the architecture style. I was, I hated the Mediterranean, and then the, I felt like it, all of it was. A little schizophrenic? It was mm -hmm. like nobody could decide on a style, so everybody just threw all their things together. So I think I'd like to commend the, the both parties. I mean, really, our staff for two years working on this project, that's, that's quite an accomplishment for something that's, you know, really going to be right, you know, in our stage here. Um, so. I completely agree. I, I feel like they thought of so many things that I would have been con concerned about, and it came out beautifully in the presentation. Everything from, you know, the trash bins and the AC unit and everything in the mechanical room and the flow of traffic and the semis. I mean, just they really checked every box that I was worried about walking into this meeting, so um, I understand everybody's previous hesitation, but as Kristen says, we are where we are now, and I think it's a really great solution for where we are right now. I think they did a great job. I, I agree with you in, in terms of the design. My concern is really sort of the mechanics and the engineering, because that that corner is going to be so developed in the next 10 years. Across the street where Docks is, we've already seen that plan, and that's going to be additional traffic. Um, Tin Roof is moving into Bull Bar. That's going to be additional traffic. Uh, if the city has its way and has more commercial activity at Old School Square, that's more traffic. And things like trucks backing up and, and making turns and diverting traffic and so forth is something that I think we have to consider in addition to the, the beautiful architectural renderings. And I'm not saying we did, we haven't. I, I really appreciated your question about the 350 because I drive a 450 and so I do want to know, am I going to be able to park there? Am I going to be able to go? You know? Probably not. I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, it seems like they really they thought that park. through. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Parallel park. I, you'll probably see me. I parallel park right on Atlanta Gav all the time, and everyone goes, "What?" <laughs> it fits. Yeah. Oh yeah. I. I mean, I'm in support. Robert, you're quiet down there. I do. I, I'm listening. I just want to make one quick comment. As far as the engineering, um, those are administrative that have been dealt with and are part of the site plan technical item. So if you look at like the 15 items that have been presented along with the other two that she mentioned, they, it is included within that that it must meet a certain criteria, so. Yeah, the, um, I understand what you're, where you're coming from, Mr. Chard, the engineering and mechanics of the project in relation to its location within the downtown. Um, but I also wanna draw your attention to the um, traffic study and the TPS approval letter, which does need to be updated to reflect the um, square footage counts that are on the current site plan. There was a slight shift in the site plan that occurred after the applicant submitted the TPS letter. That's I've already talked to the county about that. They don't anticipate it to be a problem because the site's in the traffic concurrency exception area. But um, overall, this project, what you see here versus the 2018 approval is a net reduction of 120 trips, average daily trips. So this this actually went down um, in trips. So I'm not saying that's a solution to put your mind at ease, but it's a, a note to you um, that we have looked at the mechanics inside and out. Um, this was not a project where I reviewed it alone. This was a team effort. So when we did our TAC review, um, of course, we have engineering and landscape and police and fire. And police were very involved, I want you to know, too, with SEPTED. Um, they went a few rounds on TAC with the applicant until they were satisfied. But for our staff internally, um, we had a team of about five planners, including our director. So we reviewed this as a team. Um, 
just to make sure we didn't miss anything. So we did look at turning radiuses and the valet function, the height of the garage, you know, those types of things, of course. Um, but I think they're good. It's a good comment. And a, I think the applicant is hearing what you're saying too. So yeah, thank you for letting me say that. Is your mic on? I'm sorry. It is now. Thank you. One of, you know, one of the things I think when we talk about traffic is loading and unloading. And the fact that, and I know this happened in Chicago, it was a huge issue, is you want to get all of that off the street. Don't want to have a semi sitting on the street, as happens in a lot of places in Del Delray Beach right now, unloading and loading. And no matter how many times you tell these you know, truck drivers to get there at 6 o'clock in the morning, they're going to get there at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I think the biggest element of <clears throat> the traffic element is what they did by creating that whole infrastructure that allows trucks to come off the street. And I think that outweighs a lot of any of the other things. And I think the other things are just, I have to imagine, Michelle, as you said, that you've had multiple um, divisions within the city looked at it. I'm sure the police looked at it, and I'm sure traffic looked at it and all that. But um, I just think that a lot of traffic was avoided by the way that they handled that off-street off loading and unloading. That was my only comment. Would there be any appetite from this board to eliminate the parallel parking on First and on Swinton? No, I like no. The parallel parking. <laughs> I also think there are some requirements in the code when you develop a project like this that you are required to construct on street parking where available. <coughs> so I, I would have to call. I, I just know that on federal, when we narrowed that and we put in the bulb outs and we have trees and we have parallel parking, those are really accidents waiting to happen. You have to nose out halfway into the street before you can see around the parallel parked car to see if somebody's coming at you at 35, 45 miles an hour on federal. That's a very Jim, good point. Oh, oh sorry, Ms. Sexton. Sorry. Yeah. But Jim, if you lived here before, and I know you did, if you parallel parked on federal highway before they took away the lane, that was never a problem. There was plenty of room for maneuvering. You could see what was happening. It, the way that they constructed all of that on federal, it was not well thought out. This is well thought out. Yeah. You would still have to, if, if there was an F-450 parked there, <laughs> <laughs> you'd, st you'd still have to nose out into the intersection. You can always see my truck. From any angle, you can see my truck. The buses on federal. The buses are in the middle of one of the lanes. Exactly. And I can see everything because I'm like eight feet in the air, so, you know. <laughs> I don't really worry about nosing out. I just look over the car in front of me and see. I don't know if this has been asked, but is there a bike lane? <laughs> so I just want to draw your attention to... I don't know to... that anybody's uh, asked that question. He just asked, is there a bike lane? Oh, I, can I address the site visibility really oh. quickly? Sure. Um, was, and just want to make sure there was a question pending from the board. Is, I will come back. I don't think there is a, a bike lane, but I want to understand the question before I say no. Um, on where the access points are into the site and where the intersections exist around the site, um, the applicants required to meet site visibility. And so we also went through a rigorous exercise with them to be sure that those were taken from the correct points. Um, so site visibility is, is being met or exceeded. In instances where you would have an on-street parking space, um, I'm sure that they will look at that should it be a conflict. But I see your point that you're making, Mr. Chard. Um, and they do meet the requirements of the code for driveways at, at an intersection of a street and two intersections. Uh, who asked about bike parking? Bike lane. Bike lane? That would be me. Do you mean like the bike lane on Northeast 2nd Avenue? The green bike lane? Yeah, any place, well, a physical bike lane like there is on 2nd Avenue. So there's a Shero on Swinton. 
Uh, I think Brian's here, so I'll let the expert answer. Because <laughs> I know a lot has been done in Delray Beach for bike lanes. I haven't seen anything here. So they, uh, there's no bike lane associated with this project in particular. As Michelle was mentioning, um, there is a share the road arrow, which is a typical bicycle emblem with two arrows in front of it on Swinton Avenue from 10th Street to 4th Street. That's going to be expanded in the coming future from 4th Street to the northern city limits. As of right now, there's nothing proposed in terms of bicycle infrastructure on Atlantic Avenue. As part of this study, I, I highly encourage all of you to go back and watch the commission and look at the presentation for the urban core mobility study from last night that looks at a typical section of an expanded sidewalk from 2nd Street to, to um, Swinton Avenue. That would be a little bit more comfortable for someone biking, but there's no bike lane associated with this project or with that project that I just mentioned. So, thank you. Okay, so we have a couple of different mobility efforts going on at the city that I've been encouraged by the director to, to uh, let you know about. So first and foremost, we have our parking and curbside management plan, which this board heard about um, about a year and a half ago, give or take. That's looking at the entire downtown area, how we are managing our parking from the public side, meaning our public lots, our public on-street spaces, how we address pricing, where we uh, have employees park, everything really from public and private side is being addressed within that plan. We've also started um, our bicycle and pedestrian master plan has been kicked off as of January this year. We expect to have workshops in March. Um, so look for emails from the city about that um, at, later at this month. You can find more information at walkbikedelrayabeach.com. So just quick plugs for those things that I wanted to let you all and you all know about. So thank you. Any more board discussion? We, oh, I was just going to ask if you were ready for a motion. Are we still discussing? Are we ready for if a motion? If we're done discussing, we, we could take a motion. Okay. Am I ready? Would you like me to put them up, or I, do you have them? I have them. Okay, right wonderful. Uh, I would like to move to approve the Class 3 Site Plan, Certificate of Appropriateness, Landscape Plan, Architectural Elevations, Variances, and Relocation Requests. 2020-080 for Sunday Village, formerly known as Midtown Swinton Commons, Old School Square Historic District, by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Second. Kristen Finn? Yes. Robert Ostinoff? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? I am pleased to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Charn? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know, was that a, a tear in your eye, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will tell you that over the past two years, staff has been phenomenal. Oh. Um, we couldn't have done it without their help. <laughs> we had a lot of tense times. We had a lot of happy times. But I think as a group effort, uh, we'll bring the best project we can to you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Mike. OK. So we clearly don't need tomorrow night's meeting, which we had on reserve. She said she'd let me know when she's ready. Thanks. So our next meeting is April 6th. And I don't want to put a damper on the positivity because we're moving at a quick pace here. It's 820. Um, but there are some structures throughout the community that are um, not historic or on the list or the register or in a district. Um, one in particular I saw I was really trying to work with a couple to get the house moved, um, and it didn't happen. It was demolished as the F.J. Schrader house up on North Swinton. I think it's at the corner of 16th. I saw it tonight on the way to the meeting, so I wanted to make a mention um, to the board. And I know that Mr. Miller has reached out, and we've had a few conversations mm -hmm. with the Delray Beach Historical Society on trying to come up with a way to create uh, a 
a blast of some kind to try to find as many people as we can that might take structures that are threatened by demolition. Um, so if any of the board members have thoughts on that, please call me with those thoughts so we can talk. Um, there's just a lot of redevelopment happening. We're starting to lose things before we can protect them, which was a bit disheartening to see that house go. F.J. Schrader, for those of you who don't know, um, was the architect who designed the first Presbyterian church, um, the church in the back of the property that's on Bronson, that's on the individual register of historic places. He also worked with Sam Ogren. He was an architect, F.J. was, and he was a con contractor. He served as the city's uh, building inspector at one point in time. So he's got a very ingrained history in Delray Beach and I think sometimes gets overlooked. Um, but he was, I know Sam is the first registered architect in Delray, but FJ was here around the same time. So I'm a bit sad to see that house go. And as well, the structures at the corner of 22nd and North Swinton. Um, the whole site I noticed on the way here tonight was cleared. So. Would you say Taylor House if I can ask you one? Um, no, I said FJ Schrader. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, it's on North Swinton, uh, on the west side of the road. I think it's at 16th. I see you nodding, Kristen, right? It's at the corner of 16th and Swinton. It's not the two-story. Sorry. <laughs> I know, we can't engage. I can talk to I'm you sorry. after. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. sorry Mr. I Long. Asking, I was but, that was but Michelle can speak with I can you talk after. With the you after. I'm sorry. sorry, George. I'm not going to talk. No. Michelle, when you said a blast, what, what did you have in mind? So I, I had a conversation when, um, oh gosh, what was her name? Was it Joy Howell maybe? Was Joy Howell on the Preservation Trust at some point in time? It might have been Joy. Bryce? Joy and Winnie and I had a meeting and we talked about how we could potentially create an email list that we could, I could maybe, I can't not approve a demolition permit if, if it's not an historic and somebody asks me. I don't typically get to review those, but <clears throat> I can get a list of what demolitions are coming up and kind of track them and then provide that list to, say, the Historical Society or the Preservation Trust who have mailing lists of about 5,000 um, each, and they could send it out or include it on a, a newsletter that these structures are in for demolition, anybody interested in moving them. I mean, there's structures on the Sunday Village site that are slated for demolition that could be moved. So I tell people about those. I've told the owner to tell people as well. Um, if we can we try to save these structures to see them go, especially if they're outside of a district. In our historic Delida Park, we have an email blast where we've created over the years all the new owners and people coming in. So we could possibly see if the other districts also have that of all the owners and we communicate anytime you guys send out a notice or anything or there's there's you're our most active neighborhood association i want to mm -hmm. say we are i do subscribe to your mailing list um and we do send courtesy notices and i see that yeah. they're sent immediately yeah marina has always been the next active but i think that they're working through um coming up with a new president, or I think if Roger was still here, he could talk about it, but um, they're the only two that have an active email list. But I would love to try to develop a process mm. because we're losing structures. The uh, Delray Beach Preservation Trust is uh, focusing on social media, like Facebook, and that could be, be part great. of a blast too. Mm. Luciola Park also we has it. We actually have somebody running that for us, our social media. Okay. Allison Turner, if you know her. I do, actually. I just emailed with her recently. Luciola Park also has a mailing list. Okay. So just, I, I ha couldn't hesitate. I had to tell you all about that because I was a bit sad. But anyway, this was bittersweet to see this come forward. Um, Sunday Village has been quite a process, so... Um, to be standing here and knowing that tomorrow I get to take a break from Sunday Village for a while is going Could to be Could I say nice. something? You know, we anticipated this going into the night, going into tomorrow, 
And I think what made a big difference was all the work that had been done behind the scenes. And the developer made such a cohesive presentation that I thought it was very easy for us to see the changes they wanted to make and how it was going to look. And if we got that every time, I think it would be so much better. They did a phenomenal job with their renderings. I didn't see that their presentation until Monday, and so I didn't. I didn't see that developed. I don't. I don't want to talk too much about the, the okay. project. Um, I, I appreciate what you're saying about you know them being well done and everything like that. Just not going into detail about okay. the specific items, if you could. We just can. in case. I mean, there, I it is subject to appeal, so you just have to. I think the applicants suggesting that we work with applicants to try to encourage them to do a nice presentation, which we can do. That, that Miss Sexton is suggesting that, yeah. Michelle, to go back to your point for just a half a second, wouldn't there be a way to have on the city's website, uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to say it, but houses for sale or houses that are about be, to be demolished, uh, looking for new owners or looking for uh, adoptive parents, you know, something along those lines, just as we try to save other things. So it's got to be a way to incentivize it too. That 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 to me is the challenge because I'm thinking if you know there if there's no incentive yep. with respect to maybe getting density variances or, or something to make it worthwhile to save it because face it, most landowners, developers don't think like, you know, people who are sensitive to historic preservation. They want to say, get this out of my way. And usually, what happens is all the all the best intentions, you know, end up you know be, because to move a structure, you know, even if you had a, a lot, you could put it on to move it. You would end up, you know, maybe through you know, the lengthy permitting process or, or or whatever to that that will just slow you down and get you out of your way. And then you wish, well, I wish I never even messed with it. I should have just bulldozed it to start with. So, what is you know what is there that you know, could be proffered up as an incentive to make people want to adopt a home yeah. because it's not a financial incentive. There's no there's no financial incentive to doing it. Yeah. So this is two part. One is the question I think Mr. Chard asked is, could we put it on the website? And I've had some pushback that that's not really appropriate for the city to be putting on the website because our mission is LDR based and what we're working towards as staff, but that's why we engage with the nonprofits in the community that we could at least generate the list provided to the nonprofit who could send the email out or put it on their website or social media. Um, to your question, Mr. Baffer, the um, incentives we do, we have, an, we have a couple right now who is looking at a house that happens to be east of the intercoastal and they want to move it, and that's a really tough move to come east from east to west. Um, so they looked at the, the Schrader house as well. And we've gone over the incentives with them. The number one first incentive we say is if you're going to designate the house as historic, the Historic Preservation Board can approve variances and waivers and other things that might be necessary as, as you situate a house on a lot. Um, so that's a that's a big incentive. In fact, that couple might need something like that if they bring a, a bigger house onto their smaller lot. Um, we also go over the incentives for the tax incentives, which are it's important to folks. And the idea of getting that break for 10 years is very attractive. And then we also have a way that we can um, split the process. I don't know if anyone was on the board when the CRA building was moved. Mm -hmm. Uh, we split that process. So we assisted them to move quickly and swiftly to get the building moved to the site in the relocation and then let them come back later with the site plan modification. So we, we do have ways of making it simpler and we inform people of, of these different hard and soft incentives. You're talking about the second CRA building, not yeah. the first year. Yes, sir. Well, not in an effort to get us out of here early, does, do you all have anything for me? No? I hear George telling me he does. Yeah. yeah. We all just had a lot of praise. You're hard to get yeah. tonight, yeah. Thank you so much. Great job to you all as well. Everybody yeah. worked through it, and you guys all 
gave each other time to speak, and I, I thought you guys did a really good job. So thank you all for your service. Any news on the environmental memo? I got to ask Aunt Thea. She's, I think she, she's still here. Mr. Chard is asking if we have an update on the landscape memo that's um, been sent to go to the manager's office. I don't. No, no I'm glad you it. asked me. <laughs> so, well, um, that's an update that it was sent to the manager's <laughs> office, I right. believe, because it, it hadn't been at the last, as of the last meeting. So, I'm sorry, I don't remember, and so I'm going to have to go back and I will track it. I will make sure that they see it. Thank you. I'm worrying now about another one that I'm thinking of too at the same okay. time. And it's is there any possibility that we could call this environmental preservation as opposed to landscaping? Um, I think I did call it something to that effect in the memorandum that I, I remember. I'll, I'll look at it again. It just seems like that, that's uh, a much more. Sailed. We obviously can't change it, but yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure it's to, just... to be really honest, um, the workload that's just been completed as of this evening has been really tremendous um, sure. and keeping us busy. So I did, we did do the memo. I just, we need to check to see where it's at in the process. I can email you when I find out. I think Diane took it up. I'll double check. Okay. Anything else? Thanks, Anthea. Got nothing else, no legislative items, no more reports and comments. I guess we're adjourned. Thank you. 833. George, what you have for me? Okay. Not really saving for you, but this house here looking north on Sweat, right there. Remember that house, a two-story white yeah, house? Yeah, it's a newer trim? house with a garage. Okay, the that's not the one you're talking about. Okay, that's what I thought you said, Taylor. You said the oh, center. no. But did you know that house was moved there? That house was built. No, no. My mother said that house was moved from the two-story building. Okay, I'm, at, I'm sorry, I'm up at third. Second, it's for sale right now. Yeah. Yes, I did know that. We've talked to a few um, Yeah, it came from buyers. down there in the Fiscal Church. Yeah. Yeah.